Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant to see so many of you here on day three. Um, and I'm here with Monty, very, very excited for this talk. Uh, but I believe, first of all, we're going to have a short trailer showcasing the best of Sky Showtime. I want to show the world who we are and what we do. It's time. Good morning, aviators. Let's get to work. It's Sky Showtime. A brand new streaming service. Yeah, ready? Get set. Let's go. Hold on to your goggles. Here comes Green. Yeah! With exclusive series. This is not like any game you ever played. Will you rise to the job? I would be up front with you if you get hungry. We're going to deal with it together. I'm not going to be ignored, Dan. The biggest blockbusters. Here we go. Would you like to see a magic trick? Are you ready? Come and get me. Why do they always have to go bigger? Run! By the world's greatest storytellers. Things are about to get wild. Show them what you got. It's entertainment time. Okay, let's go, let's go. It's Sky Showtime. Great stuff, great stuff. I think, yeah, that really shows a, a taste for what you can see on the platform. Um, and I want to use this next period of time to ascertain how you've got from the start to here and what's coming up next and we'll, we'll talk strategy and we'll talk a few other things. Um, so first of all, it would be good to know you've been at Showtime for around a year or so, you've rolled out into all of your key markets now. Um, how has this first period of time been for you? Uh, it's been a pretty rapid, uh, I think we've been moving at a very fast clip to, to do everything that we've done. Uh, just to give everybody some perspective, I uh, you know, took the role in February. And so in the space of just about 16, 17 months, we had to build a team. We had to prepare everything for launch. And by the way, we were launching across 22 markets. Uh, and that's everything from customizing and localizing the platform, making it available in 18 languages, localizing the content also in 18 languages, and then rolling out in very quick succession across all of those markets. We launched across all 22 markets in five months. So 22 mm. markets in 20 weeks. Mm. Mm. Had you always intended to, to move that quickly or is that just how things panned out? No, I mean, we wanted to move quickly. I mean, we, you know, uh, it was important. I mean, you, we, we saw an opportunity. We saw an opportunity in the marketplace and it was important for us to get out of the gate and come out of the gate strong. Mm. Uh, and that's what we did. Mm. Mm. I think it might be, um, might be useful for you to, to give the, the Sky Showtime elevator pitch <laughs> um, it's an interesting, it's a very interesting concept. You're launching at a time when there's lots of other streaming services and you're in quite specific territories. Maybe talk a bit about what Sky sure. Showtime is all about. So Sky Showtime is a joint venture of Comcast and uh, Paramount Global. And these are two of the largest entertainment companies in the world. I think everyone knows the brands of both of these companies. Comcast is the parent company of NBC Universal and Sky. So things like Universal Pictures, NBCU, DreamWorks, um, and of course, Sky Studios, all under that umbrella. And then Paramount, great brands such as Nickelodeon, MTV, um, and Paramount Pictures. So we bring the best of both companies together. Uh, I think it was really smart for them to form a joint venture to expand into these markets um, across Europe. These are markets where these companies historically didn't have you know, much operations, and so they decided to join forces. And it's a, I think if you look at all of the changes in streaming, especially last year, this is a, it's a smart strategy for them to do that. And the content portfolio of the two companies is really unrivaled. So everything that you see on Paramount Plus, all the great Paramount Plus originals, originals from Sky Studios, originals from Peacock, all in one place. Add to that all of the big theatrical releases from Universal and Paramount. It's, it's a great consumer value proposition. And we've also priced it really attractively. Mm, mm, yeah, I think we'll, we'll, we might come on to that quite shortly. What was the thinking? I mean, you can't speak for, for your superiors, but what was the thinking behind these two behemoths, Comcast and Paramount, not just launching their own streaming services in these territories that you've rolled out in? 
Uh, I think if you look at streaming, and obviously the, the metrics of success have changed dramatically in the past year, um, this was a capital efficient way for them to look at these new markets and say, how do we enter there rather than just going it alone? And uh, they pooled their resources. So they put together not just their best content, which I went through, but also their best technology. You know, we're built on the Peacock platform. Mm -hmm. And I, there's, you know, when people talk about consolidation going on in the industry, well, JVs are a form of that consolidation too. Mm -hmm. How do you put those two, the resources of these two companies together in order to, you know, take advantage of what is a huge opportunity? I mean, it is still very much early days uh, in our markets for streaming. So we're, very excited about that. And I think both companies saw that. Mm. These are two companies that, you know, in some ways are different, but share a lot uh, in terms of, uh, I guess, an entrepreneurial DNA. Mm. And, uh, and that's why they decided to form mm. a venture. Mm. And was that what was, uh, you, you were formerly working for Comcast, so was that what was quite attractive to you about this role, kind of tying this all together? Yeah, there were lots of things that were attractive. I, so I had worked at both companies. I had worked at Comcast and then I had spent uh, a good portion of my career growing up, I guess, at, at Viacom, now Paramount. And, uh, and I had also been running uh, a former Viacom joint venture. So that was a, also a subscription television service in the States and also went direct to consumer. So I guess you could say I like joint ventures. <laughs> That's a very peculiar thing. You know, I was a bit of a unicorn, um, having worked at joint ventures before and understanding the dynamics of joint ventures um, and having worked at both companies. Um, and I have a lot of respect and admiration for both companies. I loved working at both of them. So that made it a very attractive proposition, knowing who was on the board and, and knowing the executives at both companies. Um, but I just thought, you know, it's not every day that people are starting new streaming services. Mm. So what an amazing opportunity to, you know, come and helm something like that. Mm. Mm. So that's interesting. So you've, you've created almost a niche for yourself, which is a, a <laughs> JV looker after yeah. And so what, what's if anyone's the... launching another stream <laughs> joint venture, yeah. Anyone uh, in the crowd. What's the, what's the secret? Like, do you have certain tricks of the trade in terms of this, this quite specific area that you've cornered? Uh, well, I've done startups before as well, and I think it takes, uh, it's a unique, you know, uh, personality type, somebody who wants to work at a startup. It is a fast pace. Uh, you have to know how to scale a business quickly. You have to be able to prioritize and focus on what matters and what doesn't. And, um, and so, you know, I just find that exhilarating, exciting. There's, there's obviously the adrenaline rush of, uh, of having to stand up a business and all of the launches every single day is different and you have to like challenges you have to like trying to solve challenges mm. and how do you find new ways of breaking through mm. and how do you be disruptive in a marketplace mm. Mm. yeah it's um all of the all of the panels i've moderated so far here what what ties you guys together is having a really broad remit both geographically and in, in yeah. terms of what you're doing on a daily basis how do you prioritize well first of all what's interesting about our markets is that uh you know europe of course is not a monolith it's there's richness there's diversity and so we're across 22 markets that are very different and uh from the nordics and the netherlands and northern europe to spain and portugal and southern europe to central and eastern europe and so uh, people sometimes say, oh, you, you launched a streaming service in Europe. Actually, I launched something more akin to seven or eight streaming services, if you think about it, because these markets are so different. And so it requires a very sort of bespoke, different strategy to tackle the opportunity that exists in each of these markets. This, this, these countries are in very different places in terms of the voyage towards a streaming future. Uh, so in Central and Eastern Europe, for example, linear television is still growing. It's hugely important. Uh, satellite and MVPD players are very important partners to us. And so we, you know, look to partner with them because that's where people are still consuming television. They're still in that ecosystem. So that's a really valuable ecosystem. And sometimes people overlook that and they think that the U.S. narrative is the narrative all over the world because there's cord cutting in the U.S. There must be cord cutting everywhere. And that's not the case. Um, Northern Europe, especially the Nordics, highly evolved direct-to-consumer market. MVPDs are still incredibly strong, still very important to us. Um, but you see that there's a lot of D2C activity. The number of SVOD subscriptions per household is approaching three. 
subscriptions mm -hmm. per household. Mm -hmm. By comparison, the U.S. is at four. Mm -hmm. Here in Central and East Eastern Europe, it's less than two subscriptions per household. Mm -hmm. So still a, a huge total addressable market, lots of headroom, lots of opportunity. Mm -hmm. Are you partly able to almost report back to your Comcast and Paramount counterparts in terms of what's going on in Europe? Like you clearly have quite a deep understanding and there are, there are obviously differences. Yeah, for sure. I, and I, I think that's the great thing. That's another uh, huge advantage mm. of the joint venture is that you have all of these learnings because between the two of them, they operate multiple successful streaming services mm. with Paramount Plus and Showtime and Peacock and Now TV. So, you know, we get the, the, the benefit of all of that knowledge within the, within the family of our shareholders. And um, we certainly do like compare notes and talk about things and what are the trends and what are we seeing? Mm. Uh, because in some ways, things that they've gone through are things that you know we're going to see later on. And mm. I think they want to have a better understanding of what it's like in our markets, what's the opportunity. Mm. Mm. Well, uh, time is flying, um, but we need to talk <laughs> a little bit about originals, um, yes. which is a strategy that you're moving into. And I believe we have another trailer, which we'll start with, which Great. showcases some of your originals. Share that with everyone. Soha sem tudhatja, hogy ki a barát és ki az ellenség. Te maga az erőn protagonista. Szóltan nem hímpjadó. Vi håller på nu med en undersökning om medelålders kvinnors sexualit. Podobno żyje się dla pojedynczych chwil. Oczywiście to złudzenie. Sorpresivamente llevan dos curas del Vaticano y de repente desaparecen todos. Tío, ¿tú crees que hemos cambiado? Yo creo que no. Looks exciting. Right? Yeah, good <laughs> stuff. Good stuff. I mean, everyone, everyone will probably be very familiar with the first trailer and, and maybe slightly less familiar with the shows in the, in the second trailer, although yeah. hopefully soon, soon that will change. So why don't you um, delineate your original strategy? So I, I think between seeing the two trailers, you, you kind of get a sense of what Sky Showtime's DNA is and what our programming philosophy is. We're, we pride ourselves on being the best of the best, the best of global series and films and the best of what's local. And I think you need both to be an authentic, streaming service in these markets, you need both. And I think when we talk about Sky Showtime, you asked what the elevator pitch is. We were created for these markets. We are through and through a European streaming service. We're not a flyover service. We're not some global streaming service that just so happens to be, you know, let's flip the switch and exist in these markets. We exist for these markets. We exist because of these markets. You know, we have six offices throughout the region. And so when you look at the original programming, the local originals, that is a sign of our commitment and investment in these markets. People want stories that are authentic, that are relatable, that have characters that they can relate to. And so this year alone, in our first year of existence, we'll premiere 10 original series. And we have two for Central and Eastern Europe, the winner, which is a Czech and Slovak production, and then Varsavianka, which is a Polish uh, language original. We're very excited about these. I mean, we accelerated our original strategy by three to four years. In Spain, we've got, you know, over five originals. We've got an originals, uh, original series that we're premiering uh, in September in the Nordics called Codename Annika. Um, and so we're, to be able to premiere original programming across all of our regions in our first year is tremendous. Mm -hmm. And would you say there's, um, you know, if you were speaking to the local production communities, would you say there's something that ties these shows together that makes them like a Sky Showtime original in particular? It's the quality of the storytelling. Mm. We're really focused on just telling amazing stories. And I think others have exited the scripted space. We're still very much committed to storytelling in all its forms. So that can be unscripted or scripted. We look across genres too. Mm. Um, again, it's about having a story that's well told. So whether that's a comedy, a drama, we're open to all of those different ideas. Mm. Mm. So some of these originals came via a deal that you struck with Warner Bros Discovery, the owner of HBO Max after yeah. HBO Max pulled some of its commissioning from Europe last year. So maybe you want to talk a bit about that deal and, and the, the split almost between originals that came from that deal and, and the stuff that's been commissioned separately. Sure. 
So originals, you know, take many different forms. There are acquisitions that are originals. There are co-pros. There are things that you develop in-house, and I think they all have a place. And I think uh, every streaming service has a fair share of acquisitions that are also originals. For us, uh, you know, we saw that they had a change in strategy, and they decided to, you know, um, move away from scripted in, in this part of the world. For us, that meant that there was an opportunity, an opportunity to invest, and an opportunity to acquire these shows that were actually really fantastic. In many cases, they had big fan bases. They had content awareness, which is great for a new service like ours. And in some cases, they hadn't aired. They, and so a couple of the shows were still in post-production. And it was really an opportunity for us to be the new home for those shows, to take them, nurture them, uh, and make them successful. We're putting a significant marketing investment behind them. Um, they're just fantastic shows, and mm. so we're, we're excited and proud to be the home for those shows. They're part of the mix. Uh, so some of the originals, the, of the ten originals I spoke about, some of them are global acquisitions. We're going to be the home for Poker Face. Poker Face will premiere in September as a Sky Showtime original. Another show we have with Emma Stone called The Curse. That's also one of our global originals. And these HBO, former HBO shows, fit into that same mix of you know, in Spain, for instance, we've got, you know, four other originals that aren't from uh, that deal. Mm. And um, so we're proud of all of them. They're all our babies. Mm. Mm. And it must have felt very serendipitous almost, the, the HBO Max shows almost coming back onto the market. They seem to tie in with your strategy quite nicely, and they were, they were up for grabs. Do you, think, do you think that there's more opportunity akin to that deal as it goes forward, or, or was that quite a one-off, and from now it will be more about commissioning from scratch almost? I, I think it's rare to find, I mean, that deal encompassed 21 shows. Yeah. So it's rare to ever find someone offloading 21 scripted shows all at once in one go. But acquisitions will always be a part of our strategy. There will always, we're always looking for those stories that have yet to be told, that deserve to be told, that, that need a home, that need a platform. And again, so we, we, we do talk to people about acquisitions, but we're also developing original shows too. Mm. Uh, that just takes a longer, uh, it's a bit of a longer pipeline to get those shows to market. Mm. Mm. And your, um, about half of your originals come from Spain. Yeah. Are you, will you continue to prioritize Spain in that way? Or, or again, is that just something that's happened over a period of time? It happened because there, is, there are more original productions for mm. Spain. It's, it's obviously, it's a, it's a large market, and then producers tend to produce there because they can also leverage those sh shows for Latin America. Mm. So there's, there's just more available on the market. But, uh, you know, all of our regions are incredibly important to us. I see us doing more shows for Poland. I see us doing shows for Central and Eastern Europe. Um, you know, one of the shows that uh, we have as an exclusive is The Informant. That's in Hungary. It's one of our top performers in mm. that country. Okay. So you see the importance of local and you see the importance of that commitment. Mm. Mm. And of course, there's, there's a lot of strife taking place in the US at the moment. There's a writer's strike. Yeah. The streamers are each individually having their own issues. Are you able to stay separate from that noise, or, or do you worry that that will be passed down to, to your role and your platform? I'd say we're separate from the noise. You know, we're not part of the negotiations, obviously. Uh, but the, the strike is disruptive to, uh, you know, all of our businesses. We all want it to be resolved, you know, and we hope it's going to be resolved fairly and equitably very quickly. Writers are an important part of the storytelling process. Um, so I think... Um, Overall, we feel that we're well positioned to weather the strike, uh, and that's for several reasons. Number one, we have a pipeline of European shows that are coming from Sky Studios. Number two, we're leaning into local originals. Uh, so we're not completely dependent on that U.S. pipeline of shows. Obviously, because a big component of our service is uh, U.S. series, um, we're making plans to make sure that we can, uh, we'll still have new content premiering on the service at all times. Mm. So we're, we're stockpiling a bit of content. Good. Very good to hear. Well, Monty, thanks so much. It's been an absolute thanks, pleasure, and hopefully we know what, what Sky Showtime is about. Thank you. Yeah. It was great being here. Thank you so much.